Good morning. morning. Well, well, for me, it's morning. morning. I don't know when you're watching this. And it is Thanksgiving Day in America. And I don't know where you are or what day it is for you. But uh, I just had a little time and I was I had an interesting discussion with my wife this morning. And I wanted to kind of capture. She asked me a question that clarified my thoughts on something. And I wanted to just kind of capture it here and share it in case you find it interesting. So the... In American culture, it's common to divide things between the subject and the object. And this is like the argument between the two culture sides. There's like the postmodern, everything is subjective. And then there's the materialist that says everything is objective and there is no subject or, or that the only way we can... And then there's kind of a... In between there, materialists also sometimes have this view of like, you don't actually... You can't actually perceive the thing itself your perception is only um your mind's interpretation of what's actually happening and i think there's a i think the truth is in between i think the truth is in the middle and um and I, where i was coming from with this was the the discussion it was a while back and i'm not going to pull it up and i don't really care because it's but it's about the Google Maps and they were talking about a lot of people requesting the ability to set a scenic route rather than just um, optimizing for how for time, like for the shortest amount of time for a route. And especially with regard to walking, they were hesitant to do it because they were afraid that it might be racist. And I don't care about any of that. I think what's interesting is that he tried to make the argument that optimizing for time was objective and our optimizing for beauty or a scenic route was subjective. And I think that's the mistake um, that was interesting to me. So one, optimizing for time is also a choice. It's a subjective choice. Um, it's objective to measure where beauty might be a little more subjective or more difficult to measure or to optimize for with a computer. But, uh, but regardless, there would be, there could be ways you did it. Um, and I don't want to get lost in that. One, the idea that you're optimizing for time is objective is not true. It's just, you've made a different choice. Uh, and it's easier for a computer to compute. So I get that. Um, However, when you optimize for that, you're still optimizing and you're still and it. The way you optimize or what you choose to optimize affects the other decisions you make, you know, so in trying to be objective, you've still you've still you're still including things and not including other things. And you're still, um, you know, you're still you're you're only like all of the feedback that come, you know, all of the answers that come from your system are going to be around that choice. And so it's kind of an illusion to say um, that we haven't made a value judgment if we choose this objective measurement of time. You have, you've made a value judgment and you're disregarding beauty, you're disregarding personal safety, you're disregarding, um, you know, many other things. Um, you're, you're disregarding those things or making them less important than getting there as fast as possible. Uh, and, but this leads into an interesting thing because there is, there are, it is an objective measure um, how long it takes you to get there. That is objective and measurable. Uh, beauty is a little more difficult to pin down because it's not, it doesn't fit in a spreadsheet very well. And if it doesn't fit in a spreadsheet, a computer has a really hard time seeing it. So I understand that point of view, but my, where I wanted to go with this is in kind of getting out of this mindset of subjective and objective being um, a division and rather start exploring the idea how they're a distinction. And this goes along the line of uh, natural and supernatural as well. I think that's a false distinction. I mean, a false uh, division. I think that they're they're just a distinction. And actually, I don't like supernatural. I think that's kind of weird. But I mean, I don't. It, that doesn't make sense to me. And hopefully, by the end of what I'm saying, it will. You'll understand what I mean when I say I don't. Supernatural doesn't even really make sense to me. 
And it's this idea of the sacramental worldview. So the sacramental worldview is saying that uh, there is, you know, I can look at a tree and objectively measure how tall the tree is, but what's more important and, and, and I have a subjective perception of the tree in my mind and my mind is filling in gaps and, you know, spreading the color or, or that I see in the very center of my vision. It's spreading it out to the rest of the tree and making predictions. And yes, I'm not agreeing. I don't disagree with all of that. However, what's important is that my I have a relationship with the tree. And me perceiving the tree is the beginning of the relationship and the tree revealing itself to me is, um, is the beginning of a relationship. And as I look at the tree longer and maybe sit in the shade of the tree and lean up against the tree, now my relationship with the tree is deepening. And rather than trying to identify, and this is an old distinction, this is not this is not original to me. This is something I was exposed to is that in the West, we like to participate or we like to understand what the tree is by first cutting the tree down, counting the rings, separating the tree into its subsystems of, you know, the, the, the way that it gets its energy is from the chlorophyll and let's break it down to the chlorophyll. And then there's other uh, things like chlorophyll that work with the brown and the orange spectrums and those last longer, which is why when the chlorophyll doesn't, isn't getting enough light and it dies, it's no longer green. And then the other substances, the browns and the oranges, and I can't remember the name of those substances, sorry, are revealed. And that's why we see those leaves in the fall. And then when those aren't getting enough light, the leaf itself dies and then it falls off from the tree. And we start trying to make all these distinctions and going down, I mean, all these divisions and going down into the subsystem, because if we can break down a tree into its subparts and then break down the tree, those subparts into smaller parts, and we reduce it down to its simplest level, we're going to then know what a tree is. And we kind of lose sight of how those different parts of the tree interact with each other. And, and we lose sight of what it, a tree is because we've also just cut off the roots and I mean, maybe we've looked in the roots, we dug up the roots and we looked at those too. And you start seeing the, the similarities between the ends of the roots and the ends of the leaves and, you know, but you lose overall the picture of what it is to be a tree and you no longer have a relationship with the tree because you've killed the tree and you've broken it into a bunch of parts. So there's another way of looking at things where if you want to know what a tree is, you plant a tree and then you start caring for a tree. And this is kind of the Eastern view of relationality. And it's the sacramental view where uh, a sacrament is a, a participation in something. It's a mystery and it's a higher thing. It's a, it's a, and a, well, I'll explain it more as I go. I don't want to try to define it too much. Um, but it's my relationship with the tree. So if I want to know what a tree is, I plant a tree. The tree grows and it needs to be cared for. I need, you know, the deer want to eat the bark of the tree or the leaves of the young tree. So I need to put a fence around it so that it can grow up. I need to maybe tie it to a post so that it doesn't fall over in the wind. It has some, some additional strength there. And as the tree grows up larger and larger, you know, then the leaves fall and I have to rake it and... And then it gets a little old. It gets older, and my kids are getting older, and so I put up a tire swing in the tree, and then the kids are playing in the tire swing, and then they get a little older, and I put up, we build a tree house together in the tree, and the kids play in the tree, and then my daughter, my kids get older, and then maybe my daughter now wants to get married under the tree, and um, and I have a picnic table out there or a hammock under the tree, and I go and uh, spend time under the tree, and then my then the tree gets older and my daughter now has a family of her own and we decide to cut down the tree and make it into boards and she and now it is the dining room table in her family and we have a relationship with the tree that changes over time and develops and deepens and you know a lot of people are reminded of the giving tree by shel silverstein which is a beautiful book 
And, uh, and this is what it means to be in right relation with something. And that's a phrase that I'm taking from Graham Pardoon in his book, Sun Lilies. He really talks about how righteousness is not a list of rules, moral rules, and it's not a system. It's not systematic. It's, it's the idea of being in right relation to things. It's right relation to God. It's right relation to the people around us, our neighbors, and it's right relation to those who consider themselves our enemies, it's right relation to the earth itself. And I think moving out of this separation between the objective and subjective and realizing that they are distinct but not divided, I can have a tree, I can run as fast as possible toward the tree, and then I will run into the objective reality of the tree. And the pain I will experience from that is a subjective experience. However, they're related. I have a, there's a relationship between the objective tree and the subjective pain that I experience from running into the tree. There's a relationship. And that if we spend too much time thinking about the division between objective and subjective, we lose sight of the relationality, the relationship between those things. And this applies to... <clears throat> Um, you know, a lot of different areas. Uh, if we, if we, if we say that beauty is merely subjective, uh, then it becomes kind of personal and and situational and very small and limited to myself. And okay, I I I think this is beautiful. You don't think it's beautiful you and I are no longer in right relation to the thing itself necessarily. Uh, if we're both looking at the thing and we're both moved by beauty, yes, the experience is going to be subjective and personal because um, I'm bringing my personal experience to participating in what it is that I'm looking at. Uh, however, we can also share a relationship between us if we're, if it, if we're both participating in viewing the thing, witnessing the thing. You know, and, and we see this with like theater. When we go to a movie theater, you know, you're sitting there. Um, we kind of lose some of the relationality because everyone's trying to be quiet and not interrupt other people's experience of the art. Um, but you know, in an art gallery, same. Like everyone's being quiet. However, if we're both standing next to a piece of art together, we're both participating in that art, and we're in some kind of relationship with each other in both viewing that thing at the same time. And and I think. This also helps us to start to see how we need to be careful about what we look at and what we participate in, uh, because you can't you can't divide the spiritual and the physical or the objective and the subjective. Those are not easily divided; they interplay, and there's a feedback system between the two. Uh, this is why. The Orthodox have the argument against yoga. You know, they're in the West, we say, oh, well, I'm just doing it for the physical benefits. Uh, and in the East, they would say that you can't really divide things that way. You can distinguish between a spiritual and a physical effect. But when you're doing a physical thing that is meant to evoke, it's meant as a form of worship toward um, foreign deities uh, from another culture you are then participating in that spirit by doing those behaviors even if you aren't doing it for that reason it, it, it really it's actually it just doesn't matter what your physical what your what your mental reason is saying well I don't you know I, I just am disregarding that uh, this has a spiritual component to it and I'm only focusing on the physical component but that's just it's delusional and it's kind of myopic because you're not realizing that when you're physically participating in something, it's having spiritual effects. It's having psychological effects. And, uh, and sometimes people get so focused on just the physical effect that they ignore that it may also be opening you up to spiritual effects that you don't necessarily want to participate in. And, and I, you know, that's, uh, my, that's probably a controversial example. And if you have a reaction to that, then okay, that's fine. I don't care. Um, it was just the first one that came to mind. You know, another example would be um, 
Well, I, I guess I what I'm trying to say, I don't, I can, uh, another example doesn't come immediately to mind, but what I'm trying to say is that it's, I think it's much more realistic to understand that we are spiritual beings and, and we have, but that means that we have a body and that we have a spirit and they're together. Uh, and, and I don't, and our, it's not so easy to divide those things. And when we are watching something or reading something, it's having an effect on us. Sitting and reading has a physical effect too. It relaxes you, your blood pressure goes down. Um, you are training your ability to hold your attention. Uh, training your ability to hold your attention means your physical body needs to calm down as well. And this, they're constantly interplaying. They're constantly playing back and forth on each other. And what we're pointing our attention at has an effect on our body and our body's ability to calm down and to stay still affects our ability to focus our attention on something. These, it's a feedback loop. And I think it's easy for us growing up in America to forget that or to be distracted from that and to not remember that we're, we're a complex system with a lot of feedback loops that just are constantly in interplay. And I just wanted to point at that. Uh, and I wanted to point at the idea that there's not, that there are objective things and there are subjective things, but there's no division between them. They're interplaying constantly. And that interplay is the relationship. And that relationship is what it means to live in a sacramental world. When, you know, I'm noticing a tree um, I'm participating in the identity of the tree and the tree is participating in my identity and I'm witnessing it and seeing it and it's having an effect on me. And if I'm trying to notice the beauty of the tree, the beauty of the tree will slowly be revealed to me over time if I am willing to be patient and spend it, my attention on continuing to see the beauty and you're witnessing the tree interacting with its environment as well you know, the wind is blowing the leaves, the sun is sparkling through the leaves, this has an effect on you. It has a physical effect on you, it has a spiritual effect on you, it has a psychological effect on you. And that is how we move through the world. The, our world is relational. And what we are in relation to and what we have relationships with defines who we are. Uh, and our identity goes beyond you know, our own little subjective experience of our identity. Our identity lives on in the lives of the people around us. It's reflected back to us in how people respond to us. Um, and, and this is a more, uh, this is a broader way of, of seeing our identity. It's also a more traditional way of understanding identity and what it means to be a person. Uh, it's not as simple as, you know, your social security number and your heart rate and your blood pressure and your cholesterol level. Uh, as much as our Western way of thinking tries to reduce us to that, we go way beyond that and that we're, it's not even limited to our body. We as a person live on also in the people around us and it's reflected back to us through their reaction. So anyway, um, that's what I got. Uh, happy Thanksgiving. I'm very grateful for my life. I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for my loved ones and for the stability and the comfort and the peace that we enjoy in our lives. And it gives us time to reflect on these things. It gives us time to participate in beauty and to, um, and I hope that my sharing my random ramblings with you, um, will point you at trying to be in more conscious relation, more conscious, right relation to the things around you. Uh, I'm grateful for Graham Pardoon for pointing me and sharing that little phrase with me. That's a really nice way of thinking of things. Uh, God bless you, and uh, I look forward to... I'll, I'll, be, I'll be starting to do this more often because it, uh, it helps me take some of the strain off of my personal relationships by sharing it with uh, here instead of trying to share it uh, constantly with people while they're trying to do other things. So, anyway, thanks for coming. <laughs>